Welcome back to the Automate Construction Podcast. My name is Jared Gross. I'm your host, and I'm joined today by Michael Butler, the CEO and founder of SpaceCrete at his home and location where you've built four of these SpaceCrete buildings. Thank right. you so much for letting me stop by. All right. Well, thanks for coming here, man. It's, we're way out of the way. <laughs> yeah, cool. Let's start, I guess, at the beginning of the Automated Building Magazine. You've been looking at different construction automation solutions all over the place for how many years now? Well, I don't know, decades. I mean, I don't know how many years, but... Decades? Yeah, yeah. And where did you get into concrete? Well, I, w I was in the, the trades right out of high school and worked in the trades to being, including a concrete contractor, for about 10 years before I went to engineering school. Mm -hmm. um, the physicality started to wear on me, so I decided to go back to school. But I was building things since I was like seven, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I don't know. It's just something that's c kind of like uh, want to get out of my system. Do you remember what you built at seven? Uh, little boats, like little little boats that you could make them sail across a pond or something and experimenting with them and, you know, getting them to steer right and, and stuff like that. Like the duct tape cardboard boat competitions they do these days, or well, uh, we cut, we just kind of carved them out of foam, or okay. you know stuff like that. Whatever you find. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So you have some hands-on, uh, I guess, competence and confidence in building stuff yourself from that historically, and you were in the trades. Where does automation first come into play? Oh. Uh, well, I always like to look for a solution in in building something like, and everybody does. You know, if you're if you're framing a house or whatever, you're if something's easier and it occurs to you, you try it, mm -hmm. and it might work better, it might not. But um, if you don't do this, you're not a curious person. So, I have this endless fascination with trying to make things you know work better. And then, you know, as time went on, I realized that. No, this is pretty physical, and um, I started getting more interested in longevity. Like, in this climate here in the Pacific Northwest, wood rots pretty readily, you know. So I'm always looking for how can I have something that's inert that's going to last longer. And got more into concrete, but there are issues if you're building dwellings out of concrete because it's really a poor insulator, and it has moisture issues and other things. So I just became obsessed with, with trying to solve this. Um, Mostly that was out of school, though. I went, I went to school after 10 years in the trades uh, to become an engineer, which is what I'm doing now, mm -hmm. my day job. Um, but engineering is kind of boring, and uh, I mean, if you do it day after day. So I really have this passion for, for improving things and, and, and really focus on concrete because I just see the forming concrete is such an expensive thing. Um, yeah. And then 3D printing came along, so that was like... Um, augmented you know what I was already working on yeah and the way they're calling printed concrete 3d printing is already a stretch from what we typically expect of 3d printing so to extend form workless concrete it's almost like you're just printing it faster instead of a nozzle you could I don't know I... well it's it I've, I was involved with code approvals early on and learned what a pain that is mm -hmm. and so where well, with uh, a another business called Anchor Panel. In California? Yes, in California. And a Anchor Panel are structural panels. They attach to a modular home to become a perimeter foundation. So the home set, the panels attach. They're made according to a computer program that figures out how tall they should be. They get, they get glued to the ground with concrete in, in the trench. And we went through the code approval process for that. And it was really, really a pain. And, and they keep putting up new hurdles, like, okay, we solved all these hurdles, now here are new ones. And I really didn't want to get into that again. So with SpaceCrete, I'm trying to keep it as generic as possible. Like this is concrete that you can order at your local batch plant or you can site batch on, on, on your job site. Um, and it's just normal as possible. But at the same time, trying to save the, the labor cost. and that's been the, the, the focus, trying to combine those two things. Yeah, absolutely. And so from there, where does SpaceCrete begin? Well, n not forming concrete was an obsession quite a while ago, like 15 years or more. And did you have materials expertise when you came to the conclusion you wanted to not form concrete? 
from being a civil engineer and from being a contractor, but no specific training in, in material science, no. Was that the biggest thing you needed to learn in order to achieve concrete <laughs> I, I barely made it through chemistry. Uh, okay. And I had to, you know, that, that was like the hardest aspect of, of, of going back to college for me is, the, uh, so it's ironic that that's now what I'm my into the most. And it's, I still don't understand the chemistry behind a lot of, a lot of this stuff, but this is empirical. I like, I'll, I'll try something that might work, test it, it doesn't work 95% of the time. It doesn't improve or it causes a problem. But that small percent of the time, there's an improvement that, that is new. And eventually, you know, it gets better and better. But I don't have any, it would be great if I had more chemistry and material science training because then this wouldn't have taken so long. <laughs> yeah, I think chemistry might be the least intuitive of all the sciences, uh, or at least for me. Like physics kind of just makes sense and clicks yeah, at a certain point. Yeah, exactly. And math, it's just like this is the way things are. But chemistry, it's like just memorizing definitions and rules, and that's tough. You know, it is it is ultimately physics, though, and mm -hmm. I, I think it should be taught that way, but it's not. Um, yeah. And and I can't memorize, memorize anything, so. Valence, electrons. Yeah. If I can't really understand something and I just have to memorize the rules, I'm not going to. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Which is a personal shortcoming, but well, but but it makes you a better learner because you have to you have to learn what is the logic or what is the the, the physical forces behind you know why something works. So um, anyway, I don't know. Oh, what was no? So no no material science training, but just a lot of time in uh, n knowing about concrete. You know, our, I've worked with it for a long time, and also you know had to do formal training for testing concrete and, and engineering it, of course. Uh, so um, I just wanted to change the process to make it easier. And it really started out as a personal thing. Like, I don't like the, F, the wasted effort of forming concrete. There's all these heavy things you have to bring into place. You have to do the form ties. It's, it's, it's really the biggest single cost factor in doing a custom job with concrete that is, has a vertical dimension to it. So I just wanted to make, hey, I just want this stuff to be like a what well, comes out of a frosty machine. I just want to put it there and see what happens. Um, and then at some point after getting into this, uh, Kosha Nevis's work came online. Contour and I crafting. Saw, yeah, contour crafting, right. And I, I was stunned when I saw that first thing. I was like, yeah, that's the same stuff that I'm working on, you know. So um, that, ins that inspired me, you know, that, okay, other people are doing this too. And um, but I didn't get into the 3D printing for a few reasons. One is the cost of the robotics. But the other thing is I'm, I'm trying to have reinforced, like I'm trying to have the finished product be concrete because I, the code approval process was such a pain. I didn't want to go through that again. So the goal here is to have a result, which is reinforced concrete according to the ACI code. There's nothing different about it. There's just now at this point, just one admixture that's that's part of the, the the mix and we're sitting in front of that goal embodied in a building right one of them yeah permitted yeah yeah this this uh the buildings here are have all been permitted there's one that's a small so it was exempt um but uh it meets the california building code the international building code and all that because it's the same thing it's there's no difference california building code is so tough so it's uh maybe more points for that than any other state in the country yeah, yeah, they took the the IBC and they just added more stuff to it, um, and and you know it's it's not that different though. It's it's pretty similar. It's just that the seismic uh, exposure is the problem. Like the 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 approvals for 3D printing, the acceptance criteria 539 is that what it is that that has been developed for 3D printing. It is exempt. It doesn't it doesn't apply to anywhere where your seismic design is uh, basically air, part of Arizona and to, uh, to the West Coast. So Washington State, Oregon State, California, and then anywhere else where there would be uh, seismic activity like all the damage they had in Turkey. Uh, the AC, AC 539, I have the right number. It's AC 509. 509, yeah. AC 509 would not apply, would not allow you, it, you can't use it in those zones where there's that kind of seismic activity. They Hawaii. also say no two-story buildings, no commercial buildings. AC 509 is riddled with ridiculous uh, 
stipulations. Well, but, but see, they're very cautious. That's the, the International Code Council is that way. And I, that's, I had that lesson learned in a hard way a long time ago where we went through that, you know, and we had to develop acceptance criteria for the, the anchor panel. And <clears throat> as soon as we solved the problem and met the criteria, they put up a new one. And they are really, really concerned about approving something that will ultimately have a failure someday. So they have a really high level of conservatism and- um, It's cost prohibitive. Yes, it is, it is. Uh, and I think that you know that's something where the people who have gone through that process might kind of be regretting it now because you look at a lot of the big 3D print projects that are happening and they're not using AC509. They're, they're just using uh, engineering that's that's submitted to the local building jurisdiction and using that in lieu of the building code via alternative methods in the in the building code. The material testing requirements in AC 509 it's uh, really like robust and getting good information but it kills the ab availability or ability to just go and work and get the day just like well, print as kill, much as you can. Yeah and it kills the cost. You know, um, you know they, they have, it's really broad. Like you have to show freeze thaw resistance, you know, you have to show so many different things and yet you still can't use it for, for structure in any kind of seismic loading, which is where you, the reason why you need strength in the first place. Um, so I, I just, I feel sorry for the people that are, you know, dealing with that because I didn't find it to be very fun, you know, go, going through that process. But uh, so anyway. Why would you try to fit that you thought that space creep might comply with AC509? No, no. You were trying to print concrete. I'm, I'm just trying to avoid any special uh, provisions in the code. So you're exploring any, every option? Well, I, I didn't even explore that one okay. because it, it was apparent that this is going to be too difficult. And, um, you know, any of that stuff is expensive. And even 3D Admix has to be, be generically accepted as the admixture for concrete, has to go through that other now another number 549 or something for for admixtures and the problem is is that the the process for getting an admixture approved is it can't have surprising effects like a radical change in slump but the problem is that's the purpose of 3d admix is to have a radical change in slump mm -hmm. so it, it there, there's no criteria that it can satisfy in the existing code so that is an I issue down the road meanwhile and any specific job, an engineer can review the data and say, yeah, this, we can use this admix on this job. But that's the only thing that has to be any different other than the fact there aren't any forms in place. You know, So the finished product, you can submit for a building permit and it's just regular reinforced concrete. Whatever the regular concrete needs is what you do. You don't, there is no difference. In fact, you can change your mind later and you can just build it conventionally with forms and such. So, because the finished product is, is the same thing. So for people who are having a tough time understanding what we're talking about, Spacecrete is a concrete right. mix with an admixture that makes it extremely buildable so that you can form it and it stays in place, is that correct? Yeah, but the admixture is added in the pump line. So mm -hmm. you, it is concrete that you, that's pumpable and the, it can have a normal slump, five inch slump or whatever, whatever you want really. And the admix is dosed and intermixed with a new kind of inline mixer that uh, just got the patent claims allowed. And that changes concrete into spacecrete. And the dose is, is really low. It's very tied to the water content. So if you have a low water content concrete, the admix dose is about a half a gallon per cubic yard. Um, so it's, it's higher than other admixes, but it's, but it's a very, very low dose in terms of causing an extreme change. And some of the, the 3D printers who have tested it have told me that, well, they're only adding one drop per kilo. I mean, the, the dose is that low and they, they don't want to dose it that low. They want it actually to be less strong so that they can have a little bit of a higher dose because the higher dose has other benefits that uh, it, it, it appears to kill plastic shrinkage in many cases. Um, and the exact mechanisms for that uh, are still being investigated. It's, it's a combination of not allowing evaporation, some shrinkage compensation, and some internal curing, um, which are all things that help the in situ properties of the concrete. Uh, but it would really be really good to have some legitimate material, material science experts get into this um, because 
I'm just kind of winging it, you know. I mean, I'm finding successes, and it's all been trial and error, and uh, mostly error, but successes happen, and I keep working on them, and it's been 14 years on working on this particular problem. So, uh, you know, eventually, you come up with something, right, if you don't stop. And uh, I would like to have help, for sure, with, with more people who have more material science expertise than I do. Well, I got a PhD on call who said we could FaceTime him during your demonstration to see what's going on. Okay, all right. Uh, he will understand much. I mean, I don't know anything about materials, really. It's a, it's a big uh, dark cloud for me. And it's very fascinating. So you realize you want to print formwork. What came first, no formwork or the admix? So you needed to find the admix? No, no formwork. Like, okay, I just don't want to... I'm tired of forming concrete. I'm tired so of all that labor. So how do you find the admix from there? Well, the first one was to just replace the water entirely with, a, with this brew. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were doing, is that we would take a, a volumetric mixer would show up on site. People call it a site batch truck too, but it's a volumetric mixer. But we replace the water with this brew. And that has some problems. The first one is that now the whole mix has to go through the pump line. So from beginning to end, you're putting this modified mix through there, which has the slump killed and everything. And of course, it's more likely you're going to get a blockage, right? And um, it would be better if, you know, you could add that change further down the line. But at the time, I had to have all these solids put in to the, to the it, because it really requires thickening solids for this to work. And they were pre-mixed with the water, and they would react to the change in pH of the, the cement or whatever, the change in the environment, the... The ionic field also, you know, is another factor you can use. Wow. But um, that required everything going through the pump line. We had a lot of problems with blockages. And then we had to learn the hard way about some of the plumbing on the, the, the volumetric truck, which we weren't aware of. So all kinds of things went wrong. But it worked. You know, it, the idea worked. Um, is that the greenhouse? No. That was a retrofit on a foundation that okay. predates oh, yes. anything here. Um, it was a hundred year old building that didn't have a perimeter foundation <clears throat> and it's, it's, that's what anchor panel was. I was just trying to replace anchor panel with cast in place concrete. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a real pain, but it worked. The concept, yes, was proven, but I wanted to make it more convenient. You might not have a volumetric mixer on site. You want to just order concrete, you know, from a, your local batch plant. So how do you get that concrete to work without form? So that would be an admix. And so I worked on a, a way to inject in, in the pump line with a static mixer that didn't cause blockages. And they didn't work very well. You know, they blocked and they didn't mix that well. But eventually came with a breakthrough where the static mixer had a design of the mixing elements where it would allow aggregates through there and in fact use the aggregates to help improve the mixing process and it didn't cause blockages. It could, possibly, but the mixing fins are adjustable, so if you don't like where they are, you can back them off. Mm -hmm. And then still required uh, some length of hose beyond that to finish the mixing process. Now it's gotten better where, um, you know, I'm at the point where we can get rid of that. We can have the inline mixer right near the point of discharge and get sufficient mixing to turn concrete into space creep. Then the admix had problems. Um, Basically, the basic idea that's that's new is um, that's totally new, and the newest version of the admix is taking a shrinkage reducing agent that is undiluted. It's pure shrinkage reducing agent. That's one of the reasons it reduces shrinkage. But and using that as a liquid carrier for carrying your solids into the concrete, so that they don't react. You can have highly reactive solids that will react with any aqueous system and they're carried in a non-water SRA liquid, and they can be highly, highly concentrated in that liquid because they don't expand, they don't mm -hmm. dissolve, they don't do anything, they just remain in suspension. They hit the, the environment, which is aqueous, particularly with the, with the high pH of the concrete with, because of the cement, and boom, they, they react, and they do their thing. What are they reacting with in the environment if there's no water? Well, that's when they hit the water when they react. So that's the point, is that you keep them from reacting because they're carried to the point of the inline mixer. So it's in, printed underwater? No, no, it's There's, the water in the concrete. What's the percentage of water being used? Is it the same or lower? It can be whatever you want. 
because the, you have another liquid in the mix. But the liquid is is a is non-water shrinkage reducing agent. Okay. So it is carrying these solids into place without reacting with them. And when those solids hit the Portland cement environment in particular, but any supplementary cement, just as material, essentially, it hits that environment and they start to do their thing and they react with it. Um, so that allows the liquid to carry a high concentration of the thickening and rheology modifying solids. And it allows a way to dispense the solids. If you try to just dispense them as solids in the pump line, it, you wouldn't get good mixing. They would immediately overabsorb and they would block your orifice where you're trying to inject them. I know this because I tried it, right? And a liquid carrier turns out to be the way that it works and it allows the mixing to happen much more easily in the pump line and faster so that you can go from you know concrete to uh, rheology modified concrete in a pump line in a very short distance. And then also the liquid adds a delay because the, the water doesn't replace the liquid immediately. It takes a little bit of time. So that allows you to get out of the end of the pump line and, and get the concrete into place and vibrated and, and, and consolidated. And it isn't, you don't have to have any accelerator in this. This can be 100% thickening and rheology, rheology modifying. You can have an accelerator if you want to. That, that's the cool thing is that you can select which solids you're going to put into this liquid, at, liquid SRA so that you can change the property of the concrete as it comes out. Like some 3D printers want to have, or the guys that do the uh, artistic stone, faux stone stuff, they don't want an accelerator. They want it to remain workable um, as long as possible, but they want to st still go vertical. Great, mm -hmm. you can do that. But if you want to go vertical really fast, and you want the bottom of the wall to remain at the original thickness and not bulge out, then you want to have some kind of a set ex initial set accelerator. But there's a third thing that's happening too, is that there's a gelling action that is unique to this. And I still don't totally understand it because you can mix some of this stuff and it looks like it's gone, it's set, you're done. And you put vibration to it and it turns right back into liquid. It's, it's really amazing. And I don't understand all the physics behind it. But all I do is I keep trying things, and I, in my garage I have over 300 components, at least, probably 400 components that um, I've I have stored there and I keep mixing and trying different things. And one day a weird thing happened. I was at the airport getting my ticket, and it said, see agent, like the, wouldn't print out my ticket. Went over to see the agent. You she bought said, too many chemicals? Yeah, she said, you're on the do not fly list. And... I, uh, I think that's, she thought it was mistaken identity, which it could have been, but I, that's what I'm, occurred to me is like, oh man, I could make a bomb with all those chemicals, <laughs> you know. Uh, she overrode it and gave me the ticket, which was great. You Another know? person on YouTube who does all kinds of weird chemical reaction stuff bought a huge flask and it was just the giant glass flask that was enough to put him on a list because apparently it's like usually only very suspicious things happen in those sides. Oh yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I guess... It makes sense. If there's a couple dangerous chemicals, why not track everyone who purchases them? Right, right, yeah. <clears throat> I don't know enough about making bombs and stuff, so... They didn't give you further details about which chemical it was? No, she, they don't even, they don't say why. And fortunately, this uh, Southwest agent overrode it, so... That's good. Yeah, which I don't think you can do now. Wow. That You know, I, I don't think so, but that would be highly inconvenient and very embarrassing. Like, I'm showing up for a business meeting, and it's like, oh... He's on the do not fly list. They're like, oh, well, yeah, we don't want to deal with that guy. Um, but that problem went away. Uh, uh, but most of this is pretty harmless. It's, it's generally water-based stuff. And What's an ionic field? Well, the, 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 uh, I don't know exactly, but that's, <clears throat> that's one of the properties of the cement uh, when it's in a liquid. It's... It's a, it's a really high pH, but it also has ways where it's, it's reacting with the, the water and changing the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen. And that's what sets off some of the thickeners. For example, the, uh, another product which works for this is uh, Actigel 218 or 318. Actigel, it's a, it's a liquid clay um, that I've recommended to people if they want to you know, just mess around with, with rheology. 
And that's what it does. It reacts with the ionic field in the Portland cement environment. Um, that's what they will tell you if you... Is that ask. similar to magnetic fields? No, no. It's similar to the, to the, cha the, PA, the high pH. Okay. So, but they said specifically, no, this one isn't exactly the high pH. It's, it's the, the uh, ionic, uh, I don't know if field is the right word. But Ions is where chemistry gets really difficult, right? Right, right. And so, um, but there is a, there is a, a distinction there. And th with 3 d adnics, you don't need either one of those because it reacts with water. So therefore, it reacts with every supplementary cementitious material except for a couple of them. So if you're using cement or slag or fly ash or metacalin or whatever you're using, 3 d adnics will work. It works a little bit differently with them, but it works with all of them except for lime. Uh, not quick lime, but lime calcium hydroxide is the one where I don't know why it doesn't work as well. It really, it just minimizes the effect, which is ironic because that's what people use to put a uh, body like stucco and such. They put lime into it because it gives it more vertical buildability. But for some reason, it, it with this version of 3D admix, now there are now you can change it. And, and the 3D admix doesn't have to be just for rheology. You can put things like quicklime into it to make Roman cement. You can add shrinkage compensators, which are you know, calcium aluminate or calcium sulfa aluminate mm -hmm. based. And you can use those and you can use it as a convenient way to get those into the concrete because if you mix them with water at the beginning, they set up so fast that you're, it'll set up in the line before you can get the concrete placed if you have any kind of delay or it's a hot day. But with this, you, that stress can go away because you can, you can add this in the pump line as you go. So if you have any delay, you just stop and you only have the short length of pump line beyond the inline mixer that is a concern. And when we do that, we just un uncouple that length and, and clear it out and wait for the problem to be fixed and then, and then continue. So it, it allows you to do a lot of these things with l less effort and less stress. What about silica-based geopolymer? It, would it work with that? Well, a, a, a genuine geopolymer doesn't have water in it, so no, it won't work. Mm -hmm. If it's an alkali activated mix which has water, then yes, it mm -hmm. will work. So you're in the boat of alkali activated mixes. Some people will call those geopolymers, but a lot of people will not. Well, I don't know really the exact distinction, um, you know, but the, the, if it is a aqueous system where you're using, you know, an alkali to activate uh, something like fly ash or slag, which is your pozzolan, then um, that would be an alkali-activated alkali mix if it's aqueous. And yes, it works really well for those. Yeah, I guess regardless of the geopolymer semantics, it's an important distinction, the water and the alkali. Well, but if, but if the geopolymer is activated with sodium, sil sodium silicate, so if you're taking a clay mm -hmm. that reacts with the sodium silicate and making that as a geopolymer, this has no place in okay. there because there's no water. Got it. And though, you know, th that's a really high quality material. Um, it's just that it's kind of inconvenient because you're not using water. It's, well, using water is, you know, it's pretty universal, easily available stuff. But. Yeah, I was just at the first printed geopolymer house in the world uh, last week in Vegas. Okay. Okay. Geopolymer International. Yep. They, uh -huh. they got a house up with Renka and uh, yeah, it looks like a red 3D printed house, uh -huh. uh, but it's supposed to be geopolymer 10,000 years, they said it would last. Uh, oh, I think it's really good material, good quality material. I just think it's too expensive to build a house out of. Mm -hmm. They did mention it's very expensive. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to capture the value of a 10,000 year home in one lifetime. <laughs> right, right. Developers don't really care. I mean, if, if the contract says, I mean, if they don't have to use galvanized nails, they'll use plain nail to save a penny a nail. I mean, so, uh, and that's certainly way less than 10,000 years. I, I've been trying to, to talk those guys into using geopolymer for components. I think that's, the, that's the, really the better application, cost-effective application, because w the way I think to build walls is to make precise window frames that are, that are put in place first before you do the printing and held in place by your insulating foam, which was 3D printed before you do the concrete, and those out of geopolymer would be ideal because it, it's a 
high quality ceramic, so it has a little better insulation value than, than concrete, and it won't burn, and it um, will can be made like to really fine detail and really good strength. And, and that's an application or for cladding applications for high-end jobs. But to build a, higher, a whole house out of that stuff, I just see that as like, it's just going to be too expensive. So you develop the admixture and you get uh, a mix. It, you're no longer using the water, the liquid replacement, right? The volumetric. No, no. You can use a volumetric mixer if you want. It doesn't matter. You can use any. But we're all we're doing now is taking everyday concrete and injecting the 3D admix in the pump line at a really low dose now. That's that's them in the main development in the recent years is the dose ju has just getting lower, gotten lower and lower. And the reason for that is that the admix is shipped in a different distribution system than the concrete. You know, the concrete's local materials as much as possible and 3D admix or whatever you use is going to come via UPS or freight or maybe a big, you know, a big truck if it's you're buying a full container, but it's a different distribution system, and it's in the. If you can minimize that weight, then you're just going to save a lot of uh, fuel and transportation costs. Which did you use for these? Um, this, I don't think any of these were the recent one. Mm -hmm. It's it's the recent 3D admix now is well, no, it wasn't used on any of these. But you have a three-story project happening right over there with y the new mix. Yes, a 30-foot tall building that's been permitted which we're going to do, but the, the only thing holding it back is the funds. <laughs> sure. So maybe, uh, are you trying to raise money? Well, I, I'm trying to find somebody that wants to help make this thing happen in, in the world, and that's a, that's a whole different story. Well, what's the ideal, maybe somebody's listening who can help, what would that ideal person look like, and how can they contact you? Well, somebody who already knows construction. Like, I, haven't, I, have, I have not like, gone try to go fund me or anything like that, because um, I really need somebody who understands and has connections to make this happen faster. Like uh, I've been approaching admix companies, um, but they've been very resistant to this and that's a long, long story. Um, but I'm looking for someone or some entity which already has marketing connections, has manufacturing connections, not just in the U.S. You know, this is this is the better, the EU is a better market for this than, than the U.S. because Concrete is way more common for housing there. If you're talking housing, really, the 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 markets for this are replacement of shotcrete is the, is the easiest one to do, and all kinds of other infrastructure things. Um, so it's really about somebody who already has those connections in place to make this happen faster. I'm not just after getting funds as much as I am is getting uh, know-how on on that end of the deal. Um, and where I can go back into the lab and not run around trying to, you know, raise money or whatever that might be. I want to just keep developing the product and testing it. That's that would be the the smartest application for my time and for somebody else at what, at what they do. So, um, yes. Now, why hasn't that happened yet? <sighs> you know, this is this sounds weird, but just a couple of days ago, I had a conversation with a guy who is a very senior uh, advisor at the Small Business Administration for startups. This guy goes way back to Steve Jobs. He was he was one of the people who got Steve Jobs started when Steve Jobs went to the SBA and continued with him until he Steve Jobs didn't need the SBA anymore. And that's how far back this guy goes. His theory is that the problem, the reason that venture capitalists or whatever in the industry haven't jumped on Spacecrete is because it does work. That's I'm I'm not the one with that paranoid theory, but that's that's his theory that they they see this as being too disruptive, and that's ironic because I never sought out sought to be disruptive. I just want to solve a problem, but it turns out that this if the solution works right, which it does work, then it disrupts things. Like you know how many form manufacturers were at the world of concrete? That's got to be the biggest category or form accessories or that or that. Well, if you're talking to some crackpot that says, well, you don't need forms anymore. You can just do this. You know, that's kind of a scary thing. And shotcrete is a really a horrible process to do. I mean, I know the people who do it are really proud of, of you know, how badass they are. And I get that. I've, I've done shotcrete. I built my last shop out of shotcrete before we moved here. But 
the health concerns are just so bad now. I mean, now, now we're just aware of them that, that the, the silicosis from being exposed to spraying all that silica dust all over the place, the, the, the contractors that are in that business, they have to, to put money in a trust fund for 10 years beyond the job because that's how long it takes for the silicosis symptoms to show up sometimes and there's no cure. If you, if you have somebody exposed to that environment more than 30 days a year, you have to get them x-rayed twice a year. And <clears throat> it's, it, you have to seal off the whole job site with warning tape and signs that you can't approach this environment unless you're wearing your proper hazmat protection. So why are we spraying it all over the place if we don't have to? If you can, if you can use now digitally controlled robotics or just attachments on excavators that that technology already exists as it was developed in Sweden and it's I don't know why it hasn't really taken off in the US but that technology combined with controlled dispensing of concrete can build vertically with and using vibration for consolidation which works better than shooting anyway so and to go with your mix you've developed an apparatus to install it right yeah, a few different varieties. Yes, I, I'm I'm not smart enough to do the numerical control part. I'm just working on the interface between that control surface and the concrete mm -hmm. itself, and and what are the problems that come up, and an advantage I have in starting this so soon um, is that I'm able to recognize problems and solve them before most of the rest of the people in the industry even understand that those problems exist in the first place. You know, so for example, such modified concrete like this in any 3D print mix is extremely sticky. And if you see where they have those side trowels on a 3D printer to make a smooth surface, there's stuff that happens where you have a lot of stuff that sticks and curls and does weird things and they don't really end up with a flat surface. And well, that's one of the technologies I've been working on is what is the surface technology that will allow you to come out with a true non-stick situation where your concrete is still in a really gooey and sticky stage and I've tried every non-stick surface known to man that I could get a hold of and where the manufacturer or the developer even the latest technology out of uh, I don't know if it's MIT and they all swear that this will work and none of them work mm -hmm. but eventually I found something that works it basically has to be a sacrificial surface and the irony is that it is a an adhesive that works the best. And so that's something that I'm looking for is somebody who, who understands those fields to, to because I can't get access to the latest in materials. I can get the stuff that might be available for one purpose or another, but there's a lot of development happening with this kind of material and I can't get at it. And so I would like to get help to further develop that kind of stuff because it can be abrasion resistant enough for, for concrete and such. Where is that cutting edge material is it in the universities or yeah yeah and it's not necessarily that expensive uh the cost is coming way down but in the general sense if you can supply water you know you're ahead of the game but the problem is like if you're if you're going up a wall like this this one's like 13 feet tall where you as you're coming up with a a, a screed that that never leaves the surface it's always in contact and what happens is it gets more and more concrete gets stuck to it and the, and the friction gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you don't have access to pull it off and get water on it and go again. Okay. You need to have that surface ooze water if you're going to use water as your sole agent. Mm. So I've been developing these porous surfaces where there's water under enough pressure that it comes out the surface as you go up. Like a membrane. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and that's some of the stuff that works is actually filter material that is also highly abrasion resistant. The, there are problems that come up in adhering it, getting it to adhere and yet getting the water go through. I mean, there's a lot of little technical problems that I'm sure are totally solvable. I mean, it, the concept works. I have, I have one right here, that, that beam you see in front of your car, that's the beam and the, the bottom side that we can't see is that um, porous material and it's all plumb. There's a water system in there and that water is oozing out as we go. Um, wow. do we, yeah, it, it works when it, when it works, it works when it doesn't work. It, you know, it's like it ha it's pretty technical, like the control of the water flow. So that has, um, you know, irrigation emitters in it. And that's, that's kind of seems like the, for now, the way to control the water flow is you get irrigation emitters, build them in there and you can, those have controlled flow. 
so you can control the amount of flow you get in different places in, 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 the, in the screed. That's a screed, or it could just be the plate that's, that's uh, controlled by the attachment of the backhoe or the excavator. And for that complexity, you get to just have that one screed instead of a mountain of formwork that you'd need to build this out. Right, right. That's your control surface. So in the case of shotcrete, where you're building a basement right on the property line, so you only have access one side, that's a really good application where that is actually more expensive than conventional concrete forming because of the one-side access. If you're going to use a one-sided form, that's a lot more expensive than two-sided forming because you can't use form ties. So they use shotcrete, but shotcrete has all the downsides I was explaining. So this way, you can use that one control surface to define all that concrete for all of that basement wall. So that's kind of an easy application. When you get into two sides, it, it does get more difficult, but there are ways, and, and people who are better at robotics than me can you know, help make those come about. But the general sequence would be, for example, in housing, is that, okay, well, you need insulation anyway, why don't you do that first? So the same nonstick surface I was telling you about, even urethane foam does not stick to it. Like when it's still hot and gooey, you can slip form. So like the way that, uh, you know, Daniel Skaber has been, you know, building with foam, right? Well, you know, that has a billowy surface and you can't have total control over the thickness, but you can slip form it. And if you slip form it with this new material, if you slip form it vertically, the cool thing about that is, it, is that you can place the windows as you go. So the window precise frames can go in place one at a time because if you're doing it horizontally, they have, it have all have to go in the same time. So you can have a second robot placing those. And that's the most important part of a wall is getting your windows and doors precise. The rest of the wall can be all over the place geometrically. It just a, doesn't really matter except for aesthetics. But the windows have to be where they have to be. They have to be watertight. They have to be thermally good. They can't have air leaks. And the doors have to operate, right? So they have to have a nice vertical hinge point. And they can't, you can't have a door frame warped or like the double door like that or the door won't close right. Those are the things you get right. And then you place the concrete around those things. That's the sequence that I propose for, for future construction. For these homes, is there insulation? Yes. The insulation goes all the way down to the ground and the footing is even on top of insulation. So the, the concrete on the inside never sees the outside world or the earth. It's completely in conditioned space its entire life. So, so, the, so it's a thermal mass that has no connection and really, really minimal connection in, in, in terms of ties to the outside. So the outside has the insulation? It's, it's I've got a piece here. I'll, I'll get it right now. <clears throat> this is the construction. Cool. So there's foam of whatever thickness you want, and then the concrete is placed against the foam. Reinforcing is whatever you want to use or not. And this is the inside. This is the inside. So this is the thermal mass, and this thermal mass is goes all the way down, and it, it doesn't even touch the ground. We even put... Uh, not foam, but an insulating mix underneath this. And the foam here in, in the ground, then it's about half the thickness. And that's the way all these buildings are built. The, the thermal mass is completely uh, in its own environment and hopefully never has to change temperature very much. That's, that's a lot of foam. Foam is cheap. Yeah, it's you thick, know. thicker than normal insulation would be, right? That's the most important part of the wall. Yeah. In, in, in North America or most of Europe, the foam is a main part of your wall that matters and not having thermal bridging through the foam. And, and if, you, if, you, if you have something can digitally print the foam first, then you don't have any thermal bridging. You know you've got a complete comprehensive envelope around the building. That's done. And that will serve as a scaffold for your electrical, for your plumbing, um, any of the other utilities for, to hold your window and door frames in place. And then you need articulating placement for the concrete, whatever it may be, to place around all those existing objects. I think that's the inevitable way for, for this to go because it's so much better. Placing the windows and getting them weatherproof is a lot of work. And if you're printing the concrete with filament layer deposition first, you're actually making that work even more, you know, and, and potentially, you know, leaking. And then the the stucco or you know fireproof would go out here, and this way you have drainage planes. So you have a drainage plane between you know your thermal mass and your insulation, 
and, and this would flash back to the outside. So if water gets in the foam below or above the windows, you know, it, you flash it back to the outside mm -hmm. and then you have a fireproof stucco on the outside. Now these are connected, I don't have it here, but with stainless steel ties. So we use stainless steel ties to connect the, uh, the rebar or the concrete, really it's that's to attach the cladding to the building. Stainless steel is used, if possible, because it has half the thermal transmission as regular steel. Mm. And it's really small. It's less than a sixteenth of an inch, typically. What about uh, fiberglass? Or... You, you, yeah, fiberglass is fine, or any kind of composite. Um, <clears throat> I'm, just, I'm just concerned about um, fireproof. Yeah, that's important and, out and here. Yes. So uh, I, I want to have a, a foam that can handle the heat with, combined with ties that won't melt or burn combined with a cladding that will protect it. Because as you probably know, the second big insurance company just stopped issuing policies in California, primarily because of fires. That problem is not gonna go away. So if you can use this technology to make things not burn, now the walls aren't really the biggest problem there, but this solves the wall problem. The doors and windows are still an issue and then the roof is the big one. Like, so what if your walls are concrete, if, you're, if your roof is, kindling you know you still have a problem but I'm trying to get the 3d admix to work so well that it will work on vertical surfaces not uh, overhead surfaces not just not just walls but also the overhang and that part of the roof if not the entire roof potentially could be done with digital construction methods out of wow. out of a cementitious material by just it's, increasing the ratio the... it's you would have to use a lightweight mix um, I mean, there's a, it's, it's slower. <clears throat> it, you're not going to just call up a ready mix truck to do this <clears throat> one. This one's going to have to be uh, a more custom mix, but it appears that it is doable. Yes, it appears that that will, that will become a reality someday, and, you know, I want to help make it happen. So you've got to see decades of improvements. What do you think about the pace of improvement? Is it similar to what it's always been or it's improving faster now? Or Well, the the amount of people coming online with 3D printing is like just totally proliferating right yeah. now. That's that's a new thing. Construction is very slow to adopt things, you know, with good reason. I mean, it's construction gets criticized, you know, for being too slow to adopt. But But there are a lot of reasons for that is that if you're the first one to do something and it goes wrong, guess what? You know, you, you get sued, right? And that's, I mean, if you, I, I remember in the past searching construction patent and what I come up with is patent defect lawsuits, wow. not patents that you would for positive things, but negative things. And that happens, you know, people, if they're, it's their own house, it's their biggest single investment, you know? And what do you think of as a, really cool concrete innovative project well the sydney opera house would be one right well that contractor lost his ass okay that was that was a from the construction management point of view that was a disaster architecturally it's wonderful you know it, it's a it's an icon but um contractors who are experienced are are really careful about being the first one to do something so that's why construction is slow to, to develop but it has to develop because it's just ridiculous now there, that so many things are so radically inefficient. And I think this is more the role of government. You know, I was just looking at these NSA grants, right? They don't even have construction as a category. It's like, what? You don't even have construction or not even, or even construction tech, which doesn't really mean construction. It means software. Usually. It's not hard for me to believe that people don't want housing innovation because so much of the American economy is in the mortgage yeah, it's also something people can relate to because they live in a house, you know? I mean, you don't really care if manhole covers are different or stuff like that because you never come in contact with it. But everybody's into housing. And I was really surprised by that. Like, I, you know, I just started looking into these things. And no, there is no category of construction for... And I think that this is a place where, where government is really has an important role to play because if you can't get insurance in California because of fires, I think this is something where the, hey, if, if somebody's working on something that can start to solve that problem and make a house so it won't even burn, then maybe, you know, the government should like be funding that kind of research. Yeah, or 
something decentralized like crypto insurance where people pay in and they're not paying a premium of profit on top. It's just the uh, something decentralized where there's no, I don't know, maybe technology can enable something like that and make it easy. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, 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 it, you have crypto. I'm, I'm pretty anti crypto. I, I don't really have you. crypto anymore. Okay. I, uh, in the beginning of my journey, I had working a construction job. I saved up like eight grand and everyone was worried about inflation. So I put it in Bitcoin right at the election time and it did well, which like funded maybe like eight months of my travels, but I depleted it. So, uh, I don't really care what happens to crypto. Well, but, but you know what people aren't made aware of? And I had to I had to do this math myself. Cryptocurrency generation develops 28% more carbon than all the cement production in the United States. Wow, 28% more. So more, it's like almost neck and neck in terms of magnitude. Well, U.S. not worldwide, okay. but still, it's like it's 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 a zero sum game. You know, it's like cement production is building cool things, right? And and helping us live better. Crypto mining is just so you can get some of those, whatever they are, instead of somebody else. You know. Yeah, I don't really love crypto in its current state because most of the applications people come up with for it, it's like an Excel sheet. Like you can just do if you just that's just called tracking data. <laughs> like we've been doing that for a long time. The benefit is when you have something that lives on separate nodes, so that no one person owns the whole system, and you have a computer that is validating that the other person's computer is not cheating the system, and it's like community accounting. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I get that, you know. That's about thick of, we probably have the same understanding of crypto. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but that's, construction is slow to adapt for, for good reasons and for bad reasons, you know. And I understand the hesitancy, and, and that's why in, in, on these projects is that I built them here, I took full responsibility, and I'm not trying to pawn this off on anybody or getting anybody to pre-buy or anything like that. I mean, you because you kind of had to, right? Because it's so difficult to do things new the first time. No, I have people that want to use it. Mm -hmm. I get I get calls all the time, and I'm resisting it because I want to make sure that uh, it's really market ready. And if there's any issue, I want to find out about it here. So, yeah, I'm pretty conservative. Even though I'm an innovator in concrete, I'm actually pretty conservative about deploying it. Engineered heart. Yes. Yes. So. The three-story building with the new material will be a big proof of concept. And from there, you'll be ready to explode? Well, who knows? I mean, that will be such a huge undertaking. Um, right now, I'm kind of strapped because of the patent costs. Like, the, the U.S., I can handle most of that. But you get into the EU, which is actually called the EP. It's, it's, it's bigger than the EU. And... Those are unbelievably expensive. Um, and and then after you get through that, then you have to decide which individual countries you want to pay to get into. And some of those countries aren't very big, but they still have good markets for concrete because they build more with concrete there than, you know, there there is almost no concrete housing in the U.S. really. I so mean, if somebody wants a global patent, what is that, like a half a million dollar investment or what's the... Well, there's there's no such thing. I mean, there you, you, as close as you can get. I know you can't really patent China. No, you can patent China. It's just that it's very corrupt. China is actually a relatively good deal compared to the population. You know, it's a gigantic population, and it costs about the same as it's U.S. Cheap, but they don't respect it. <clears throat> it is corrupt. <clears throat> okay, I'm. There's no other way to say it. It is is very. I mean, remember what happened when uh, this is trademarks, but all of a sudden Ivanka Trump got all these trademarks like that, right? Well, that didn't go through any process. They just do it because they wanted to, you know, curry a favor with Donald Trump. And <clears throat> yeah, I imagine we probably steal some of their stuff too every once in a while. Maybe I don't know. Well, I, you know, I hope our spies are doing their yeah, job. We but, should keep it tit for tat. But um, uh, it's not worth it if you're not a Chinese citizen. Unfortunately, I had to learn that the hard way. Um, the 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 Europe is 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 a good market for this. There's no point in, you know, patenting in Zimbabwe or something like that because <clears throat> labor's cheap, right? I mean, th this kind of stuff is where labor's expensive and you're trying to save labor. So it's going to be uh, a more developed country generally, you know, not always. But I have people contacting me. They want to use this in the rebuild of, of Turkey and Ukraine and, yeah. and even Syria. And um, But they don't have a pile of cash they don't have the wherewithal you know they don't have resources so it's like well 
That's great. Well, but... the lack of resources is what makes this applicable because they can't ship in all the form work. They can't get it's it's potentially less mass. Well, they know how to build there, but I've I'm surprised at seeing a lot of this destroyed uh, structure in Ukraine. Is like, man, it wasn't that good in terms of energy efficiency. Like they didn't really have any, any any insulation. It gets cold there. Now, if the building's really really big, that becomes less of an issue, but. Um, I'm about green, about making a building be like close to zero energy as possible. And that's why that, all that foam, you know, it's like put in the insulation first, make it bulletproof and then make something that's seismically sound mm -hmm. with that. So like the stuff that came down in Turkey, it was, it didn't meet the seismic codes. Okay. It wasn't even close in most cases. Do you get earthquakes here? Yes. Have you had one since you built these? Yeah. Yeah. And they're it's, fine. No, nothing happened. You know, we our, our our wood framed house got some cracks in the drywall on one and made a lot. Of, I was surprised how much noise it made. I was mm. really surprised. What magnitude do? You... Well, actually, here it wasn't that much. Maybe a six. I mean, and and, and six something. I mean, that's you know, it's uh, exponential. Like a a seven is ten times the energy of a six, mm -hmm. but it's a little more complicated than that. That's what the epicenter and you're some distance and you know it's yeah. There's actually a different uh register for this sh the shaking index which is different than the the Richter magnitude but um would it knock the coffee off the table they would spill it mm -hmm. but um, not, okay that's pretty precise yeah right right and and make noise you know it was i was surprised at, at the at the noise of that one and yeah i've been in more severe ones too but um you know, who knows what could happen? It, it depends upon the natural frequency of the building compared to the, the, the frequency of the earthquake, too. Um, this stuff here exceeds anything in Turkey in terms of they didn't have, they probably had not the best concrete, but also the reinforcing wasn't the more integral stuff that you need. If you're going to have <clears throat> tall, slender shear walls, you need to have a lot of, of confining steel in there. You can't just have vertical and horizontal bars. You need to have steel to keep it together when it's overloaded. <clears throat> and that's the kind of stuff that is really difficult to do in CMU construction or in uh, uh, foam block construction because you have all these form ties and, and stuff in the way, and even 3D printing can't do that. It's easy to do with this because you have perfect access. And uh, that see that pile of galvanized looking stuff there? That's the confining steel that I had a bunch of it made up. Mm -hmm. And it has to be at really tight intervals to meet the code. And it's, you know, it's with good reason. Um, and that kind of reinforcing is really much more facilitated if you have access to the wall at all times. And so you just sink it in? You just, no, you, it's pre-placed. But as you place the concrete, okay. you're, you're verifying that you're getting consolidation. If I have a 13 foot tall wall, it's only four inches thick, which is what this is. And I'm trying to go down 13 feet through all the steel. I don't know if the concrete's made it to the bottom and got consolidated. So I, don't, I don't have a vibrator that long. Does the inspector want to be there on that day? The slip forming doesn't need special inspection, which it can be surprising. Shotcrete does. Um, 3D printing according to AC509, I think it does. But um, no, slip forming doesn't, but you can verify it as you go because you're only placing concrete that's a foot high at a time or six inches high at a time. So you can verify, yep, yep, consolidated, yep, we can move on. And <clears throat> if, you're, if you have a form only four inches thick and 13 feet tall with all that confining steel that's two inches on center, um, <clears throat> You're going to get aggregate snagged, and, and you're going to have hot honeycombing and stuff. Um, it probably happens a lot in in the styrofoam blocks where they don't know because they never see it later on, and that's why they have special inspection, like you're saying, for the CMU block because it has the same issue: these small crevices, and 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 that's even you know six inches or eight inches generally. Um, <clears throat> so. Seismic is uh, a pain with concrete, but I think that you want to make it uh, a little bit overkill so that you not only do you survive the earthquake, you don't get any damage. That's, you know, unless it's a really bad earthquake, you're going to get damaged. But as much as possible, you want something that just rides it out, doesn't have any issues, and you don't even have to worry about it. What about the scalability of the admix? If it was used in all concrete, would there be enough of it in the world? Is it uh, limited? Um, <clears throat> yes, it, it would have, uh, there, there would be availability in that you, you can 
substitute other components. Okay. Like you're not totally restricted to one type and one source. Now, some are going to be better for some applications. Um, generally, this is stuff that's pretty ubiquitous, actually, okay. and not very expensive. Now, the liquid itself, I'm not sure. I think that it, there's plenty of it. It's, it happens to be a liquid that is uh, coming online, becoming more popular because it's green. Um, Good. <clears throat> yeah. And not, it's not a hydrocarbon-based liquid. It's non-toxic. It's approved for human contact for consumer products. I thought every consumer product was hydrocarbon based. No, th no, this is not. Pretty cool. What did we miss? Um, I don't know. Development. We're talking about development of the right now in construction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many people coming online with 3D printing with the best of intentions. And I feel sorry for them because I'm, the, I see a lot of businesses that are really going to struggle. Um, my, my perspective is I come from the point of view of being in construction. I've, I've been involved in over a thousand construct, unique construction jobs. I just figured that out the other day. Developments, I've seen how developments work, which ones fail, which ones don't. And so I kind of see that from the big picture. And I see people coming into this that they know how to move a robot. They know about this or that, but they don't know anything about construction, really. I mean enough to build something, but to see it from an overview point of view where you, you can see what's going to succeed financially and what's going to fail. And I'm afraid that a lot of these people are really going to have a hard time because now they're competing with each other. Well, there's no substitute for decades of experience, but how do you get the people with decades of experience to integrate with the people who have the robots? Well, that's what I want to do. I, you know, I mean, one of the videos I have online that I put on a long time ago is like, have mud, need robot, you know, and, um, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that because you're I've, kind of in the robot guy category. You're in both. I guess you're in both categories certainly. But the uh, no, I don't know anything. Enough. I don't know anything about. But you're cool. engineering and climb, so you're messing with chemicals and uh, science stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I you know so that's all it is, and you just get people who do that in different niches together, and that's what 3D printed because you need the materials. You need so much detailed software expertise, mechanical expertise. No one person has all of it. But the material is a limiting factor. Yeah. I mean, if you look at these wild visions of the future that are put out by um, all of them. The, the researchers in, in, in Europe doing work on, on 3D, they, you know, they, they don't call it 3D, they call it digital concrete, right? And they're envisioning this slip forming of highway, bridge overpasses, and all this stuff being done when all these zeros and ones coming in and this, this concrete stuff coming out. Well, robotic technology is not learning this, it's the materials. It's like, how do you get the material that is affordable to do that? And so that's, that's where I see the, the weak link being, and I'm just fo focusing on that end of it. And I have a specific example, like, like Twente Manufacturing, they're in you know Vancouver, Canada, yeah, right? next. Well, really good at what they're doing, right? Brilliant, awesome equipment. They, they, they can 3D print stuff and arch, so they can do stuff that, that, that is overhead and, and supports itself, really good stuff. And they had to give up on a housing project because the material is just too expensive, right? That's the problem. The people who develop or contractors, they're not quirky like consumers and have, they're, 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 they use cold, hard logic. If it costs more, they're not going to do it. It's got to cost less and, and, and still satisfy all the design criteria. So that's it. You know, you can have the, the most elaborate and coolest 3D print stuff, whoever you are, but nobody's going to build a house if it costs more and doesn't have a reason that they want to pay more, you know, and that's like the geopolymer example. There, it's aw geopolymer is awesome stuff, but it's too good for a house. Yeah. House doesn't have to be that good. In fact, these people keep talking about the, um, oh, their stuff is 6,000, 7,000 PSI. Well, you only need to be 2,000 PSI. You know, the, the problem is not the compressive strength of the material. The tensile it's, strength. Well, yeah, exactly. The, the, the flexural strength and also the ductility that it doesn't crack or shrink or do weird stuff. And I think in the future, we're going to get into the, um, uh, the permeability, the vapor permeability. Like, I think we're going to want to have better control of that. Like the way uh, some, some are doing it, I think probably both 
Icon and Diamond Age are just sealing up with, with spray foam. And it's not too different from here, except that I'm putting all the foam on the outside and the concrete on the inside. But that, you're ending up with a, a wall that is not vapor permeable. Well, their foam is the structural component, whereas for you, the concrete is the structural component. Well, but what I'm, what I'm talking about is the vapor permeability. So if you have an impermeable wall, which is one school of thought, then you need to have uh, a vapor recovery. You need to have uh, heat recovery ventilation. So you need to have ventilation mechanically done for that house that doesn't lose too much heat in the winter. So they have a heat exchange where the air goes out and the air comes in through okay. the same heat exchanger. And you have to run that all winter long, basically. Or, or you, can't, you can't dry a towel on the rack, it won't dry. Now they're in the desert, so that helps, but particularly in like this Pacific Northwest and a lot of the, the upper US climates, you know, having a totally impermeable wall and if you don't have a permeable attic, which can, can solve the problem, then you need to have mechanical ventilation. In the, in the future, I kind of want to explore more with having permeable concrete and a permeable wall, not have necessarily having closed cell insulation, having the drainage planes, having open cell insulation that's permeable and having concrete that can do some of that, that breathing so that you can have a more um, passive uh, conditioning. Yeah, Icon, me and Belinda Carr stayed in a 3D printed house that Icon did on East 17th Street in Austin and she had a CO2 monitor and we had some neighbors over for pizza and the, uh, the CO2 levels were getting high with just four of us eating pizza in the two bedroom, two story house. So You mean higher than they would uh, normally? Yeah, it was above a thousand PPM or whatever. Uh, so the thing was like going orange and uh, not like it was a dangerous scenario, but it's not the ideal amount of CO2 in the room. So. Right, right. And they increased the ventilation in the new Wolf Ranch projects. They have uh, the entire lower, there's like an airflow at pre-described portions or something. Okay, yeah. Well, that's, and, and the, the California Building Code requires basically on almost any house to ha include that mechanical ventilation now mm -hmm. with the with the heat recovery ventilator. <clears throat> I would prefer not to have to run that all the time, though. You know, I would okay. like to have a house that just passively yeah. did all of its stuff. So uh, that's something that I'm I'm working towards. Um, but that's I have the more immediate issues to take care of first. But that's the direction I see things going to. Away from the realm of productivity, is there anything experimenting with all those chemicals? Uh, did you figure, find anything like really unexpected that maybe wasn't useful, but it's really fascinating? Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. I can get, I can get Portland cement to melt a solo cup. I don't know if I, I, I would, I'd be really surprised if anybody else can do that. It's ordinary Portland cement with, with, with a version with different stuff put in the 3D admix and it somehow dispenses it so well that I can get a cup to melt. It's like a catalyst that speeds up the reaction and increases So the heat. fast, yeah. Now, is that practical? No, because <laughs> it makes the concrete too brittle or the cement too brittle. It's a perfect answer for my question though. Are there any more? Oh, I'm sure there are. I just can't think of them. Um, you know, I've been messing around with Aircrete with this, but this 3D admix approach and Aircrete don't work together. So. That's that was, and I, I'm not saying it's a waste of time because you always learn. But this, in case anybody wants to try it, you know, using thickening solids to put into aircrete, it just makes the aircrete collapse. It doesn't; they don't like each other. So you can you can not worry about that. And the reason why it's not working with lime so as well as it should. I mean, it, you can still get it to work, but you have to use a bunch more, and then you're just spending more money. Um, I still don't know why. I mean. You know, uh, you might have saw where I was asking Tyler Lay about that. He thinks it's, well, it's because lime is known to, calcium hydroxide I'm talking about, is known to absorb admixtures before they can get into the cement and do mm -hmm. their thing. So maybe that's the reason, I don't know. But it, it works really well with, with slag. In fact, it makes slag stronger than it would be. Like I did, something you never do is 100% slag, no, no other... In, uh, no other binder or activator and it is really weak but it's considerably stronger with 3d admix i don't know why um same thing with fly ash and and metacalin metacalin 
is a calcined clay, which is more expensive than cement. And I have a lot, actually a lot of these cement, supplementary cementitious materials are more expensive because they're in such demand now. But metacalin is a good one to just keep an eye on because there's an unlimited supply. Metacalin is just a clay that's easily found and cooked at a very low temperature. And it, it, it is complementary to lime and other things. So if you mix lime and metacalin, it acts like the poslin, and you can get a much stronger mix than with just the lime or just the metacalin. Um, and yeah, right now it's expensive, but it has really good properties, and it's, it's, there's no shortage. Like we can run out of fly ash and slag, mm -hmm. but we're never gonna run out of metacalin. The ratio of cement for 3D printed concrete is really high, like maybe 40% cement. Uh, whereas my understanding, regular formwork concrete might be 15% or 20% cement. Right. Uh, what about your system? It's it can be the regular 20%. I mean, that's wow. the big saving. So, yeah. like 3D print mix, <clears throat> having so much more cement, which is 50 times more carbon intensive than the aggregates, and so it ends up being about two and a half times as more carbon intensive per unit of the mix. Then you take it from a centralized location and ship it to the job site, including all the aggregate. So your transportation carbon consumption is way higher, right? So it isn't greener, okay? You can use less, and I think there's really good applications for it, but if you can modify on-site of local native materials and use that, you're coming out way ahead on the green thing. And one of the reasons filament layer deposition needs more paste because otherwise it looks bad. You, you see it looks bumpy and cracky and stuff, and the stuff that looks really, really smooth has to have a higher proportion of paste than you need. But if you can vibrate, you can really lower the paste. Mm. Like, if you take regular concrete like I'm doing and you don't vibrate it, it looks pretty bad. It looks like, oh, there's not enough cement in there. As soon as you confine it temporarily and vibrate it, boom, it looks smooth and like solid concrete. So that actually is something that you can't hold against the 3D print mortar people is that um, they're not vibrating, you know, and vibrating is really the solution there. The other thing is that if you don't have coarse aggregate, you need more paste because coarse aggregate has more volume, less surface area, so you need less paste. And if, and if you're just using sand, like in a mortar mix, if you're 3D printing or not, you've got to have more, more paste in it. So um, I'm, you know, trying again to get back to the, the regular vanilla concrete. Now, do we want more cement in it than typical? Yeah. Like the, the nomenclature around here is like, okay, a five and a half sack or six sack. Well, this might be a six and a half or seven sack to work better. It doesn't have to be, but it is, makes your life easier to, uh, get a, a smooth surface on mm -hmm. it and stuff like that. Um, so it's still well within a realm and it can be exactly the same thing. It can be exactly normal concrete, but you probably want to make it a little bit richer to make your life easier. But 3D printing has like, what, two or three times the amount of cement, right? So A lot of cement, maybe 45% a lot. Oh, that's really high. And, and so that's the part that shrinks. Now, you could say, okay, well, we're using supplementary cement just as material, so it's greener. But yeah, you can use that with regular concrete too. Caltrans mixes here now are half slag, half cement. So get used to it because that's what's happening. And in fact, it's hard to get, like we ran out of fly ash on the West Coast. Now people are finding sources again. And now slag is hard to get too. The Lehigh, the local supplier around here, they have a long-term contract for slag that they signed into. So they they have a supply, but other suppliers can't, other batch plants can't get slag either. And you have these laws in California where you have to use so much of supplementary cement, just materials to reduce carbon. And, um, you know, that is putting the price of them actually to where they can cost more than cement. So it's not, you're not saving money anymore, but that's okay. Um, so if you can just use, use less paste, then you're better off. And another one is limestone powder. Um, limestone powder is really inert, but they're finding that 15% of it doesn't hurt anything and it's, it's doesn't, you don't have to cook it. It's already cooked, you know, not just the natural stuff just ground down. Mm -hmm. Really, it boils down to transportation costs. Like if you're living in Nebraska and you've got your local batch plant, anything else costs more. Even if it's free, 
It's because you, ship it. you got to get it there. Yeah. I like Adobe because you can just shovel up the dirt. But it shrinks. I like it too. And if you kill, the shrinkage is enormous. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really like to study construction in other countries. And I noticed like in rural China, they use Adobe for outbuildings, agricultural buildings, but they never use it for their own house. And mm. I, I thought that was so weird. They're really good at it because China, the ner term you know for pottery is from the clay. And we we're in that part of China where they have the really awesome clay and they use it a lot to build but they won't use it for their house, which I thought was interesting. And you can see the shrinkage is in, just incredible. I mean, you can just see giant cracks in the wall. And, well, they don't care. The cows don't mind. I think that, like, um, a, Adobe specifically, where they make it in bricks, and then they let the bricks shrink on their own, and then they stack with the bricks, mm. that's that allows you to use it, yeah. you know, but now you're not getting into automation, right? That's really highly manual stuff. I thought that's what Musk wanted to do with the uh, boring company is take all the stuff that it spits out and turn it into little 10 cent bricks. At one point they were talking about that. Sure. But yeah, it'll be exciting to see what kind of other developments automation takes. It's really hard to predict. Like the Tesla has that bionic humanoid robot they want to make maybe that will help you out a little bit if i don't know hold I, the screen it's probably too expensive they're supposed to be 50 grand yeah okay cheaper than a robotic printer i mean i the uh using an excavator to me makes sense where it's applicable because it just moves all contractors need it anyway and you can store it outside they're meant to just live out in the weather and you can put on the attachment yeah. and the attachment already have you can have the, modular. the gps wired into it and Okay, now I'm going to use it. So the same excavator that, that, that dug the trench for the canal can place the concrete. You got to get with the built robotics guys with the uh, or dusty robot. They have like automated forklifts and automated excavators. And well, yeah, that that technology started in Sweden, and that's still where actually where the, most of the expertise is. And um, you know, Encon, uh, Steel Wrist. Uh, I can't think of the other one, but um, they started the the. the you know, controlled thing. And then the Topcon, Leica, and uh, the other geoposition company, I can't think of them right now either, but they, um, they, they all have partnered to get the systems to work, but I can't get those guys to return an email. Hmm. Maybe they're watching, I'm unlikely, but reach out. I don't know. They, you know, they, they have to be concerned about somebody just having a crazy idea and they're probably really busy with ongoing projects and did their own development so well you ready to look through some of these buildings oh yeah pack? man okay there's five there's four buildings and one big retaining wall so all right cool let's get to it thank you so okay. much okay all right yeah hey thank you thanks for coming by Jarrett.